Okay, so welcome to the third artist talk for the series for Arc Studios and Gallery. Uh, tonight we're going to hear from Rachel Liebman, Bonnie Levinson, Priscilla Otani, and Einar Gergen Weston. They're going to share with us um, information about how they came to their art, the work, uh, the medium that they work in, and also the pieces that are in the current exhibition at ARC. We have the ARC Studio Artist Group exhibition on view at ARC through November 14th. So let's go ahead and get started. Rachel, if you want to unmute yourself and then introduce yourself, tell us about how you came to ARC, your medium, and the pieces that are in the exhibition. Hi, I'm Rachel. Um, I came to ARC through the back door, like I do most things. I, um, I loved drawing and painting when I was a kid, but um, by the time I got to high school, I, I'd pretty much given it up. And in college, I think I took one art class. And it wasn't because I didn't still love it. And I think I knew even then that I, that I had talent and I was creative but I just was so unsure of myself. The um, artists in college were, were um, they were cool. And I, and I had a hard time with that. So I think I just had to grow up and get confidence. And the way that happened was that I have an identical twin sister. And at one point she started taking painting classes and every time we would talk on the phone which was every few days it was all she could talk about was her painting classes and what she was doing and and how great it was and um i went down to visit her and when i was living in new jersey she was in washington dc and i saw her paintings and i thought oh, those are good you know we have the same genes so she can do it i can do it too so i started taking painting classes and got just as obsessed as she did. And um, um, that was the beginning. I started out as a painter and um, I painted pretty pictures. I was good at landscapes, but I don't think I really found my voice in art until I started going into collage. And I think that's because the collages, I could use the, um, the source material as another layer of meaning. I um, could use, I used images of ancient manuscripts and I used um, photographs of people and of buildings and graffiti and street art. And um, it just started to be my artwork that people recognized as, as mine. Um, my collages look like paintings, but um, they're, but I, the, the things I put into them just have a, a, another meaning and um, did collage for many years, just exclusively collage. And just recently, in the last few years, I've started, um, I started branching out to other mixed media. So I um, was using watch parts, vintage watch parts, buttons, pipettes, glass pipettes, uh, and um, you know anything that strikes my fancy, I collect things. And um, often <laughs> I collect and people give me something. I don't know how I'm gonna use it. It stays on a shelf for a year, sometimes two years. And then I wake up in the middle of the night and I've got this idea of what I'm gonna do with it. And that's kind of what happened with watch parts. I just, um, someone gave me a little um, bowl, little container full of tiny little watch parts. And I kept them for well over a year. And then one day started sewing them onto material. And um, that was that, I just got obsessed with, um, with, with watch parts. Um, I like to reuse things. Um, I, it's not just for the, for the ecological reasons, but I like that they had a, had a life before 
before I started to use them, um, before I give them a new life, um, that there's a history that comes with a piece. And that's, mm. that's very meaningful to me. Um, when I started making tapestries out of buttons, I, I put out the word to friends and family and, um, and then on next door and on Facebook that I needed buttons and every, every woman my age and older has a, a tin of buttons that their mother had and their grandmother had. And there were so many stories that came with it. One man gave me a huge tin and they were his mother's and his mother had died the month before. And he just didn't know what to do with them. He felt it was wrong to throw them away. So when he saw my note, it was just this, this catharsis for him. He got to give him buttons to someone who's going to use them in um in their art and he doesn't have to be the one to throw away his mother's buttons so um what else traveling always gives me inspiration for my art i love i love to travel and um it's mostly the indigenous women that are sewing and weaving and dyeing and things like that that just um i i just I, I love it. I went to India um, right before the pandemic <laughs> hit us. I got back on March 1st and um, I went on a textile tour and there were so many things. Every day I learned a new technique and it's not that I'm any good at any of these techniques, but I take a little bit of each and put it in into my art and um, that's that's great. So. The pandemic had a big effect on my art for a while because I, I just, I couldn't make myself go into the studio. And in fact, I had a room downstairs in my house, but I couldn't even make myself for the first month or two. I couldn't even go down there for more than an hour um, and be by myself. I just had to be with my husband and son. And, um, and then finally that got boring and I decided that I could actually do my artwork um, but I was doing it from home so I started collecting stuff um, from the backyard leaves and bark and berries and fennel and things like that and using them to put in big pots of, um, of water to and creating dyes to dye fabric with and um, yeah, my husband and son were going crazy because they smell really bad, some of them, especially the purple cabbage was was a, a big no-no, but I um I did it anyway. <laughs> so um finally I got back to ARC because I, I started to, you know, even the abnormal starts to feel normal after a while. And I came back to the studio and I've been working there again and um, still doing a whole lot with watch parts. Okay. So this is one that I did. I actually did this one right before the pandemic and it's called Tempo. And those are all tiny little watch parts. So um, the little hands that go on the, um, on the, um, on the dials and little tiny parts that are inside the watch. Um, I think it, they look like writing and calligraphy and, um, and create a, a movement. So sometimes I just take the smallest parts that I can find and, um, and, and sew them onto the fabric. This is an old tablecloth that I, I used for, for the background in, in this quilt. Um, I have a, a friend who does my frames, um, some of you people in San Francisco know her, it's Katerina Kunerni, and um, I love that it kind of makes everything a little bit precious by putting them under glass in a frame. Um, this one is called Birds on a Wire, and I, you can kind of guess why. It's um, um, every mechanical watch has a piece in it that's called a balance cock, and it looks like a bird. So when I started taking watches apart, I found um, that the that these birds, I found all these birds, and pretty soon the birds went into their own container, and I would, um, and 
then I would use them in pieces for birds, birds on wires or birds in trees. And um, I, I love those birds. This is another birds, <laughs> birds on wires. This one I call Midnight Congregation. And it's got the moon there. And I just imagine all those tiny little birds sitting on the wires chattering away with each other in the middle of the night. And I've also gotten into doing um, 3D pieces. This one I call Time Drift. It's sort of like a, reminds me of a hot air balloon. And it's just um, watch parts that I um, string together with wire and um, using a, an armature, which is an old, I think it's a hanging plant stand on the top. So with beads and wire and, um, and uh, watch parts, I create um, three-dimensional hanging sculptures and they can, they can turn and they create beautiful shadows on, on the walls. Hey, Rachel, thank you so much for uh, sharing that with us. So what was your original inspiration to use uh, watch parts? Yeah, I didn't really, everybody said, well, do you have a thing about time? You know, is there something about watches? Do you collect watches? And the answer to all those is, is no. I, um, somebody gave me a little container of watch parts and that just set me off on it. And then I started to ask people, you know, give me all your old watches. And my mom works for a, um, a thrift shop in Indianapolis and any old watches that came in, she would give to me. And pretty soon though, I got so caught up in watches that I, um, that my suppliers weren't, weren't, um, weren't enough. So I now buy them in bulk on eBay. I buy them by the pound and I make deals with the sellers. You know, if you, instead of, they usually divide them up into little lots. And I say, you know, sell me 20 pounds and you know, at half price. And so I get these big packages full of, full of watch parts. And I've become really good at taking them apart. I got tiny little screwdriver set and the magnifying glasses and can't ever imagine putting them back together though. And um, I never thought about, about, you know, the idea that I was using watches and that was time until I started doing it. And time is just such a, a wonderful metaphor for so many aspects of our lives. So I now when I'm doing a timepiece, I'm thinking about, you know, the pandemic and how we're just kind of all biding time now and waiting for <laughs> waiting for this to be over. And so um so so I love that that can go into it. But mostly the watches are just um the watch parts are just because they're exquisite. They're just beautiful little little things that harken back to uh, an era when people, um, people actually um, cared about craftsmanship. If you look at a watch now, you know, an electric watch, it's a piece of plastic and a battery inside. That's it, so. Okay, and then one other question. Um, it looks like most of your pieces are all in earth tones or natural tones. Can you just address your color choices? Well, that's, I think, because the, the watch parts are, are sort of natural colored. But I do have another piece in the show that I, that's blue. And I dyed it blue using purple cabbage. And that was a, a huge success of mine during the pandemic was trying to get blue from purple cabbage. You can get a purple or a red, but getting blue and you have to use baking soda, but you can't use too much. And, um, it took me many, many tries, but finally got it consistently. I can get that blue now. And um, so <laughs> anyway, it was, it was a small victory, but it felt really great to me at the time. So. Okay, well, thank you so much, Rachel, for sharing uh, how you came to your artwork and sharing um, the pieces that are in the exhibition. So we're happy to have you as part of art. So you can go ahead and mute yourself. If anyone has questions for the artist, they're welcome to type into the chat room. You can put comments or questions in the, co in the chat room and we're welcome, uh, we welcome you to do so. So now we're gonna introduce our next artist, uh, Bonnie Levinson. So Bonnie, you wanna introduce yourself 
Tell us about how you came to art, um, your medium, and the pieces that are in the exhibition. Thank you, Stephen. Um, well, I enjoy being part of the art community. Um, I love coming to my studio, which is on the second floor, and I feel like I go up to my tree house to uh, get away from everything, which has been very, very useful during the pandemic to feel um, so secluded and also safe. Um, so I grew up right outside of New York um, with all that New York has to offer, just a short train ride away. My mother loved art. She loved museums and theater. So my childhood was spent with New York as my playground. Um, in public school, my notebooks were filled with doodles, but I really spent all my free time acting and being in musicals and singing. Um, so something happened in 12th grade. I had a really great humanities teacher. For a public school, it was pretty extraordinary. And we were given an assignment and we had to interview the person we admired most in the world and that person had to be in the arts. So I thought, well, this is great. I'm gonna go interview a Broadway star or I'm gonna go meet a director. And I was all psyched about my, my theater career. Um, and you know, I often went to the Museum of Modern Art. It was very much like my museum. Um, and on one visit, I came upon a room filled with Mark Rothko's paintings. And I had such a incredible reaction to them. I was near tears. I think I had a catharsis. And I said, I'm gonna go interview Mark Rothko. Um, so I went to the phone book and I looked up his name in the phone book and it was there and I called him up and I said, hi, I'm in 12th grade and I have to interview the person I admire most in the arts and that's you. And I had no idea that he didn't give interviews, that he was, I didn't know anything about him. So I did all this research and I was all prepared to go and you know, I put my hair in a ponytail, I had my little mini skirt on and he was mortified. You know, he came to the door and we both looked at each other and he didn't look like an artist. He was wearing a, like a, a shirt and a tie and I went, where's the paint? Anyway, if you're interested, you can read about this interview that I did with Mark Rothko on, Rothko on my website. Um, it actually, I made it into an audio performance called Sun on Your Back and you can see it on bonnielevinson.com. Um, it became the centerpiece of a one woman show that I did, um, which was a combination of Whoops, I forgot to have kids and you complete the picture, which was a living memoir. And it basically was a performance-based piece with an, an object-based interaction exhibition. It took place in my mother's closet. And um, it really details my journey to finding my creative self. Um, so Rothko really had a big influence on me because he basically said, you complete the picture. And he talked about the power of personal experience and personal uh, expression and the power of art as a, as, a, as a real force. And then it was very personal because I had all these questions about, you know, and he said, I am not an art historian, you know, I'm an artist. So it was very traumatic, but I did get an A plus on the interview because I think everybody was so surprised that I actually got this interview. But it really galvanized my interest in the arts and um, it eventually led me to a career in art and arts education and curatorial work and museum administration. But what happened was interesting. So I was accepted into this small liberal arts college in the middle of nowhere. So for me, that was very exotic. Um, it was in the Midwest. It was an all male school. I was in the first class of women called Kenyon College. And um, I basically had my camera with me all the time because the, 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 the landscape was so exotic for me. It was so rural. Um, and I decided I really wanted to learn how to do pottery. Um, and so I applied and I got a grand and I got a potter's wheel and I built a kiln. And I, as a result of like starting that whole thing, I got a fellowship from the Thomas J. Watson Foundation. And the idea was it was a post-independent study year abroad. And I traveled all over. And my thesis was to study pottery as an expressive form and how it reflects national character. So I went all over Europe and Israel. And I worked on an archaeological dig. I did restoration of pottery. But, and I worked in all of these study collections at the V&A looking at pottery. And I thought, oh, 
you know, when I go back to the United States, I am going to work in a museum and I'm going to make them really exciting because sometimes they can be like really dead. So um, I found this graduate program in Washington, D.C., um, and it was the second class, and I applied and I got in because I was really, really determined um, in museum education. So I wound up doing my, um, my graduate degree there. I got a, uh, a wonderful internship at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and I later started working at the Delaware Art Museum, which was a, uh, a museum that had a school attached to it. And I, my job was to connect art making with art looking and looking at and, and really interpreting the collections. I had the best time there. I worked there for five years and I worked for six years at the Hudson River Museum, developing innovative approaches to really looking at art using artists in many different ways. I had architects and dancers and I had poets in residence and I did film programs. And it was really, really exciting those years. Um, I got a really a little too good at like getting money for my own programming. So I wound up evolving. And um, um, for eight years, I worked as head of development for the New York Public Library. And I traveled all over raising money, but also traveling exhibitions because my area really was the collections um, to Japan and, um, Anyway, it was very creative all those years. And then I moved to San Francisco in 97. I became deputy director of SF MoMA for External Affairs. And I have to say that at that point, I felt the most distanced from my creative self. Um, and that's a whole other story. Um, but I think I had a basic difference of opinion about what was important. And for me, museums were centers for social change and they were places that you brought the people who didn't come to museums and they weren't that interested in that at that point. So anyway, after that, I started my own consulting firm and I was doing that for many years. Um, I worked with people about the joy of collecting. I helped them, I helped them find art and really understand uh -huh. the art that they had in their lives and aesthetic education. And then um, I did curatorial work for Federal Hall, um, really, commissioning contemporary artists to deal with themes that have to do with democracy and how debate defends democracy. And recently, I'm in the final phase of co-curating a program in arts education and artist residency program in Richmond, California, where we really focus on the students working with artists and creating permanent uh, site-specific sculptures for the campus. So about five years ago, I looked at everything and I decided that, um, yes, I had been doing photography for many, many years, but I wanted to work towards becoming a full-time artist. I joined the ARC family in 2016, um, and the work that I put in this show was all created in the past year, mostly during the pandemic. My photography work was the beginning of my artistic journey and has stayed a really consistent part of my practice. I've traveled extensively and have interpreted my encounters with um, the various people that I've met along the way in, in, in portraiture and, um, uh, and, and, and really, really understanding um, kind of the role of photography and seeing. Um, so as I worked uh, looking at photography through the lens, I began to realize I wanted to paint and create other ways of seeing. So I felt like the more than 35 years of looking at art was like overflowing in me. Um, so I've included only one photograph in the exhibition, but it, is not, it, it doesn't indicate a lesser commitment to photography. Um, my photographs have a painterly quality and often play with a perception of reality. Um, or in this case, uh, through photo collage, um, and double exposure through a series I called hallucinations that juxtapose the built and the natural environment. And this is the first part of a series I am currently working on part two of this. Often photography becomes a part of the work that I do either through actual photo transfers or as a sketch tool. When I paint, I lose myself and I feel like I'm channeling inspiration as if I've done this before in a former life. Um, in the earliest moments of committing paint to canvas, I try to access the realms of both the consciousness, the conscious and the unconscious. I often close my eyes and feel the energy of the colors and connect with my feelings. 
Um, in this piece on the precipice, which is 60 inches by 48 inches, I'm, I use layering and collage in the work. Um, I work mostly in mixed media, um, usually with acrylic, uh, with, in this case, with string and collage. Um, this one was created in the middle of COVID and represents my feeling of being at the precipice. I, I think I feel the irony of living in a place so beautiful and yet so vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Um, you know, nature, I feel definitely replenishes me, but um, I feel affected as we all are by the air quality caused by fires decimating our homes and nature and all across the planet, this is happening. So I think for me, um, I felt, I feel sometimes like I struggle to creatively digest my emotional response to issues daily um, with aesthetic interpretations. And this one has us entering into the fourth dimension. Um, uh, in the next piece, um, Gauguin's Tree, uh, it was really the first time, this is an 18 by 24 inch piece, it was really the first time I worked with oil stick and acrylic on canvas. So. This actually had a complete painting underneath it. And um, during COVID, I started painting on top of paintings. And I, I found that very satisfying because I could use some of the forms and some of the colors, but I could edit things out. And for me, this is kind of inspired Gauguin, by Gauguin and his use of colors separated by heavy black outlines. And Gauguin paid very little attention to perspective and, um, and I really like the way he eliminated subtle gradations of color. Um, so this was my, my Gauguin's tree. Um, the next one is um, called Nefertiti, and it's my salute to the great royal wife of Pharaoh Agnaton. Um, Agnaton was responsible for starting a religious revolution and really began the whole idea of one God, and in this case, the sun God. Um, this is an 18 by 24 inch acrylic on, and collage on canvas. This also was another painting. It was actually a painting that was really more about aliens landing um, that I used as a basis for this. And like, I, I don't know what to say because um, so much of what I do is spontaneous and, um, flexible and experimental with materials. And I, I like to respond to the surprises and questions that the work poses and presents. And sometimes I react to the colors, I react to the light, the smells, the textures of a particular place, other times to the imaginary and the spirit of the unknowable. So, you know, for me, it's, um, it's kind of, I try not to think. You know, I spent so many years intellectualizing and looking at work that um, I, I kind of feel like I just want inspiration and, and to kind of follow that road because I have so much, I have so much visual stimulation in my head. So um, I'm going to, I'm in a show right now. Uh, no, actually, I'm in a show right now, as you know, but I'm in a show that's going to be opening in November, November 26th to December 26th at Photo Place Gallery in Middlebury, Vermont. I've shown there several times. This one is about portals, windows, mirrors, and doors. And I'm very interested in portals, and I'm interested in looking through things. Um, and I've exhibited frequently at the Center of Photography uh, in Fort Collins, Colorado. And this year, I was thrilled to have my work installed in Times Square in uh, an exhibition of tumul Tunnels of the Mind, which celebrated the 150th anniversary of um, San Francisco Art Institute, which I am pleased to tell you will exist and will continue. I just wanted to let you know that as a member of the board, that's the really good news. So anyway, in Times Square, Square, I finally made it to Broadway. So. Okay. <laughs> So Bonnie, thank you so much for giving us uh, such a great account for how you came to artwork and talk about the pieces that are in the current exhibition. Um, in the second piece that we viewed tonight, the larger painting, um, when we hung the piece, there was canvas exposed on the edges, which uh, we couldn't see in the image here. But could right. you just address that and talk about your choice of letting yeah. the raw canvas be shown on the outside of the piece. Oh yes, I apologize that this photograph doesn't represent it. You'll have to come see it in the show. 
Stephen called me and said, what's all this stuff hanging out? And actually all of that is a part of the kind of tearing apart and getting through to the portal to the fifth dimension and the fourth dimension. So yes, all of that is a part of the, uh, of the piece. And uh, it does, when I looked at this photograph, I said, God, I took that photograph before I really installed it. And um, yes, it has all this canvas kind of hanging from it. And Stephen was really kind of puzzled by it, weren't you? <laughs> Yes, but it looks great. So thank you again for participating. We're happy to have you part of ARC. Uh, you can go ahead and mute yourself. And then the thank next you. artist is Priscilla Otani. So Priscilla, if you would introduce yourself, tell us about how you came to ARC and then the pieces that are in the exhibition. Welcome, Priscilla. Thank you, Stephen. Um, well, I was born and raised in Japan and I came to the U.S. when I was 18 to go to college. The portal you see behind me is my uh, family home's door, which had a great deal of signif significance. Um, it's the back door to the house, not the front door. It was both a wonderful door and a terrifying door. As you can see, it's not in great shape. That is somewhat similar to what our home was like um, before we sold it. Um, a house falling down in disrepair. Um, it's a secret door in that you're not really supposed to go outside of it. But it also carried a lot of imagination in my youth. Because from sitting against that door, I could imagine horror stories and ghost stories and people sneaking into our house. And in fact, we had several break-ins through this portal. Um, I don't have a formal education in art but I've been making something with my hands since I learned to use crayons as a young child. My corporate experience was in human resources and human rights compliance. And, and in both fields, my ability to think creatively helped enrich my work experience. And I felt that my creativity was recognized in the jobs that I held. Even with a heavy work schedule, I didn't ever think of giving up create, creating art or writing fiction. My dream was to work hard and to retire from corporate life at age 50. And I was able to do so at age 49. And I've been able to focus on my artwork since. Because I'm one of ARC's partners it, and also on the board of the Northern California uh, Women's Caucus for Art, I found that creating install installations, making collages and fiber art are logistically easier for me to, to, uh, than in other medias. With these chosen media, I can make up, make my art anywhere at any time. Because of my relatively busy schedule, I haven't focused on applying to very many exhibitions or artist residencies. I'm fortunate to have built relationships with curators who have invited me to participate in their exhibitions. Because without these opportunities, I would be spending far more time creating art in isolation and helping other artists through my work at ARC and NCWCA. I'm interested in political and social themes in both my birth country and in the United States, where I'm a citizen. I also like to combine folklore and shared historical beliefs with these themes. My earlier work focused on the underground life, a life that many people outside of Japan may not have been aware of. Buried under the civility of contemporary Japan are the practices of the old ways, prostitution, abortion, and the untouchable cast. More recently, I've been focusing on the supernatural, particularly the cult of the white fox, which touches on Shinto religion and female folklore themes related to shape-shifting, bewitchment, and revenge. Political, political life in the US was basically background noise until Trump was elected. Then it became an obsession. Creating art on political themes helped me process the onslaught of emotions that I feel every day. It also helps me document in the here and now. This first piece is called Do You Remember? And it is actually being exhibited virtually in another venue. And in fact, I gave a talk about it about an hour before this talk. It's a collage um, and it's um, 18 inches tall by 24 inches wide. And it is based on a conversation that occurred on Facebook. 
I, I went to international school in Japan, which meant that most of my friends came from a lot of different backgrounds. But it was a missionary school, which meant that many of my classmates, which with whom I'm still in touch through Facebook and through reunions, come from the Trumpian side of the family. However, we all get along very well and we get together every five years somewhere in the world. And this particular conversation that triggered this, this collage was based on a memory by one of my classmates who had just gotten off a leg brace from an operation that she had three months prior. And to celebrate, she had gone to a, a store and bought some Japanese crackers. And she reminisced about how, how much fun it was to buy these things in Japan. And so many of my classmates from around the world responded to this, both giving her encouragement in her recovery and also sharing their memories. And even though our backgrounds in politics may be very different, you know, those of us who really are, you know, in the, in the fight for Black Lives Matter and those of the other side who are into the right to life side, we all came together and we shared reminiscences that were some level of commonality. And that is what I wanted to represent in this piece of art. This is an example of my uh, white fox pieces. Um, I did some paintings last year, which I was not able to continue this year due to COVID. I have not been working in my studio, but have been working at home instead. But I did want to continue the theme, and these are all collages that I made, which are about eight inches by eight inches in diameter. And I fuse different kinds of Japanese papers. When I go home to Japan, I generally go to uh, temple, uh, temple sales, where I can pick up these uh, copy books, you know, Japanese are still into doing, doing their practices of calligraphy and then they basically get rid of them, throw them away. And of course I pick them up at the temple sales for almost nothing and I use them for my collages. And the brown paper backgrounds here are based on old wrapping paper that must have wrapped old kimono, beautiful um, textured paper, which I've also used. But in these, I, I bring in the fox theme and some of the mythology pieces. Here's another one. I'm currently working on a daily exercise of creating a partisan, uh, a set of partisan pol political creatures. Um, and um, in this particular case, these are all six by um, four by six postcards, postcards that I've collected over the years that are basically free ad cards. I, I work out of Folsom Street, so that means there's a lot of postcards related to uh, BDSM. I also have postcards from my trips, um, collected from nightclubs and bars and all kinds of things. So I, I've, worked on the, uh, I've worked these collages on the backs of those. And it represents the hyper-partisan politics that exists today. I alternate the uh, characters from one side of the political spectrum to the other. And I also have researched the, the um, part of the name calling that have, has gone on with these individuals. Um, none of these are made up by me, but on the other hand, they are names that are given by Trump to his opponents or um, media people that have named some of these um, individuals. But um, I wanted to sort of start to document all of the various people and their, uh, what they're saying and what they're being called. And I, yeah, I, I'm not, and I, some of my friends who go on Facebook or on Instagram are very dismayed um, because when I, when I do the, uh, their side of the political spectrum, they feel like I'm insulting them and I'm going like, just wait till tomorrow and then you hear the other side. Um, and I plan to continue this particular series for the time being. I don't really have an end to it. Um, and I certainly have not run out of characters to, um, to demonstrate. So um, as you can see, I, I do representational artwork and I very much enjoy um, working out of art and enjoy the community of artists that I work with. Okay, Priscilla, thank you so much uh, for telling us about your history and how you came to artwork and the pieces that are in the current exhibition. Um, so the pieces that, um, that we last looked at, the postcards, the colors in those are so striking. So could you talk about your color choices in those pieces? Certainly. 
Um, as I said, I, I'm not working out of ARC right now. I'm working at home. So I took a bag of papers from my studio and the bright colors are actually origami paper. I happen to have a large stash of those and I wanted to use them up. And so that is, that is primarily the striking colors that you see. Okay. And um, do you have inspiration as to what you're going to work on after uh, November 3rd? <laughs> I don't like to think too far in advance, but I'm looking forward to getting back to my Fox series. Okay, could you share with us uh, the symbolism or the story behind the Fox? Well, you know, the Japanese are very fascinated with the Fox, um, both as a Shinto deity, it represents um, fertility, it represents the rice, and oftentimes in the fields there'll be a little statue which would be very sort of um, abstract in shape, but sort of represents the god of the rice and also the fox at the same time. The fox serves the god of the rice, actually. Um, it also is associated with Japanese folklore that's unrelated, really, to Shinto. Although there are a lot of temple uh, shrines in Japan that are dedicated to the white fox, and some of them are quite spooky. The fox is considered a vengeful spirit. It's not necessarily a friend friendly spirit. It is primarily a female character, a female that has either been violated by a man or have been murdered by a man and coming back to take revenge um, by uh, torturing men um, and uh, paying back for all of the bad stuff that's happened to them. But um, they're also, um, I think, part of the yokai folklore. Um, but yeah, I, I love visiting the, uh, the various fox shrines. Some of them are extremely spooky. And um, yeah, I really, I really love the fox uh, as symbolism in Japan. Okay, great. So thank you again for participating. Uh, we're so happy to see the, uh, these works in the exhibition. So you can go ahead and mute yourself. And now our last artist is Einar Gergen Weston. So Einar, if you want to introduce yourself, tell us how you came to your artwork, the medium that you work in, and the pieces in this exhibition. Welcome, Einar. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to say, like, I was born as an artist, but not, not quite true. When I was a little girl in a small village in Turkey, I think I was too busy running after horse cars, stealing fruit from neighbors' uh, boxes as if we needed more uh, fruits. I just uh, wasn't, I didn't come into a very art full of family, there was not much around, but I still would like to think the, the details of a, a big old olive tree trunk, uh, as we have many uh, in my parents' olive orchards, or the, the lines, the veins in a fig tree leaf, and the, the cherries in a box. I was always fascinated with the details of, of this beauty that I saw around me, but I personally did uh, nothing, nothing uh, about it. Uh, as years passed, I mean, I was busy, life, you know, goes on. Uh, as years passed, I think I started opening my mind, you know, a little bit, a little bit more and making time for it a little bit more. My biggest inspiration came when I uh, with my husband David went to Japan for the whole summer to learn a little bit of Japanese. Japan is full of inspiration, like, you know, everywhere you get inspired. There I started creating uh, individual small uh, greeting cards for people, one of a kind. And from there it became, uh, I liked my designs and it started becoming uh, designs for children's clothing, just for everybody around me started getting these one of a kind uh, kids clothes with my designs on them and uh, then when we moved to states because I was still working in Turkey in between the times that I had this gap and then I was like hmm, maybe I should take some classes at the Academy of Art that's where it kind of started it started with first history of fashion then we went to the history of cinema then all cinema related classes then I was working in the uh, independent short film projects. Uh, while I was doing a variety of art classes, I went to this uh, yoga retreat at Joshua Tree, and there was this uh, photography class 
uh, I took the class at the end of the class to the teacher I showed this little booklet that I had made from my trip to Brazil and when he saw it this is my good buddy now Scott Finn who is an artist in the uh, in the art community also he is if you know Scott he went like this ah, you should give this class why are you taking this class you know he was very excited with my photographs that was the, for the first time for me somebody had seen some of my photographs and I was like mm, I guess he likes them you know all good but then a few months later on and he called me and he told me that he booked me a show and I didn't have any pieces out then they were just in my uh, computer I said I don't have anything he said well good I ha you have two months now you can create get ready for this show that's how I had my very first show and then it was like, oh, there's a studio available at 1890. Would you like to you know, come over here? I was like, okay, I'll get a studio. Then once you have a studio, you got to work on it. You need to pay your rent. And then it started, you know, going from there, uh, one after other. Photography was always, you know, has always been my dear love. But at the beginning, I think I was doing more like I did micro, the natural, the architectural, the abstract. Uh, I think I started finding my own voice when I started doing a lot of, you know, different uh, camera movements. I was very fascinated with the photographs that you take from the moving vehicles, the lines that it created. I felt like as it, it captured that time, the moment. Then I was like, how about I just move the camera myself intentionally and I create this like memory and I realized when I do that, I kind of soften the bright colors. They become more pastels. They do become more a dream, the memory of the old place. I think around that time, there was a lot of longing for Turkey also. Uh, these, I just did a lot of the dream series uh, where you see everything in a little bit of a moment. Everything is a little bit uh, blurry. Uh, the piece that we will see later that is in the show that is from those uh, dream dream series that you can see a little bit of the movement of my camera as uh, time passed I became even more interested with this idea the concept of time I uh, was very curious how can you capture the this uh, space we have where we are in the past and the present and the future at the same time. I started taking multiple exposure photographs where, you know, three images combined in the camera. And I got fascinated. You could do a lot in the camera itself because uh, you can do a lot with the computer, you know, with all kinds of apps and so, but I really still wanted to spend my time outside. So this realization that camera has so much in it, you can move it, shake it, you know, have highlight exposure. You can just do variety of st stuff. And this is how I started with my multiple exposure series. First they were synchronicity, and then they became murmurations that uh, where you see generally like big white space. And then on top of it, you have little black figures. I like how uh, they are in ways like magnetic. You want to get close to them. You want to understand. You can see in the highlights, there are more shadows. You see the other people. You get curious about these uh, people. And at the same time, you get curious, like, how did she do that? So I love creating that. And I love the idea of being a little bit more painterly with my photographs and uh during the the covid times i guess we are still in it uh, at the beginning like uh, rachel i didn't do much it was a lot to just to find your own rhythm with life i did get jealous at times friends baking bread doing macrame finding themselves i was like i don't have time for any of these uh, and then when everybody started settling then the creative ideas you know people started doing more stuff still nothing was happening to me it just uh, i don't know with the new rhythm with the things 
uh, I wasn't being creative in a sense that in my own path but what I did because what I you know have learned over the years it's good to keep the the art mind the brain going on it is like a you know there's the muscle there's the uh, you just need to keep it running so I started taking a lot of online classes if I couldn't make time for art at times now I had to make it because I took a class, I paid for it, so it kind of made me to get into the, uh, this little studio that I, I created in our house. You know, easy to run away at times, you know, from kids, even though sometimes they follow. Uh, I, with these projects, I just did one class, you know, after other. Uh, only recently I had this, oh, moment i think it happened thanks to the new uh, camera and after doing years of black and white photographs suddenly i was like let's do color so uh the colorful one started i have you know only one example that which we'll we'll see and uh, in my practice since i started I had always have my images uh, printed on certain photo paper and then mounted on different thickness of uh, acrylic. And then some of them frame, some of them no frame. And uh, the piece that we will see at the show, the bean, is my very first piece that is uh, printed on museum quality metal. Uh, and then it is framed uh, with a custom uh, black uh, art box frame. And now the new series that uh, I'm going to create with this color idea that I have, I think they're going to be in metal also. Here is the piece uh, from my memories, from my uh, dreams. Uh, this, this was, I wanted to have uh, this piece especially because this was like the times where we were all close to each other like this. It was like an old time dream now. It felt like not only a few years ago, but like really a decade ago. So this is the, the name of this piece comes from this beautiful uh, architectural uh, sculpture in the Millennium Park in Chicago, the Bean. So this is what you're seeing is the reflections of people on the bean. So the photograph is actually, I took the, the bean, but then at the same time, I moved the camera slightly and you can see the lines of it. Uh, this piece is 40 by 60 inches with a, with a black frame around it. And the next one that uh, we will see, this is uh, that I'm very, very excited about. It's only like the moment that you feel like oh, I have the new series uh, that I, I'm very very happy about it these are again the part of the multiple exposures but now there are not only three of them this one is like four or five multiple exposures on top of each other at this kind of a little bit more black and white days i love to bring to my own self even a little bit more a uh, joy and all the colors that you see on the screen you just can create it with the camera so there's no no editing except a little bit of cropping this image i am very happy that i didn't need to do anything about it and i just like they barely managed to get it printed for me i just got the first example in metal and it doesn't even have its frame yet but I am very excited uh, with the way that they will come and they will look in the, in the frames. And the next piece uh, is that you might recognize these series that are my very uh, beloved murmuration series where uh, this photograph was uh, taken in, in Greece in the big uh, public library where people walk through each other. You don't, uh, they, people don't see each other. You don't always see all the details of them, but maybe later on there's a little bit memory of the people. Uh, this piece that you see is at a show, uh, the design company Gamble Plus. It is a 30 by 30 and it has a black art frame around it.
Okay, Einer, thank you so much for uh, sharing your history, um, how you came into art and photography and explaining the pieces in the exhibition. So the pieces all have uh, people in them. Um, so do you do other work that does not feature people and why did you choose the, uh, this series where you have people in all the pieces? Very, very good question. Uh, I think I do have some uh, photographs that are not uh, people, but I don't think that they come out much or I don't turn them into something. They're somewhere in my computer. I think I'm just fascinated with the movement of the people and just watching them uh, for a, a long time. There are other things I am, you know, one day I will bring out all my photographs that I have lost the photographs of all these shadows, like, you know, how the shadows cast, cast at places and how it creates these beautiful pieces. I will maybe, you know, years later on, I will bring out all these photographs of these beautiful, plants and dry plants especially the detailed micro photographs of them but i feel like i'll be a little bit more famous until then and then i'll bring them out <laughs> you can't you know you need to be a little bit more different you can't just you know get you know all the stuff out i like this is something different it's fresher so i'm still uh, at a place where i want to do something that i haven't seen before but then I can go to the, some of the other work. I'm just fascinated with people shortly. Okay, and then most of the pieces are pretty large scale. So can you talk about why you choose the scale that you use? I just, I mean, I love the large, large sizes. If, if it was, you know, even more possible economically and place-wise, where do you, you know, uh, keep all these large pieces? There are some of the pieces like, for example, there was one piece that I did years ago. It is only 12 by eight small. And I had this piece for years. And then uh, this summer, uh, a fancy furniture company, Nider Living, they wanted to have it 40 by 60. Again, huge like It looks just way better. And it, I'm just, it talks to you more. And uh, it, I really, really like it. Even though sometimes I wonder whether in San Francisco people have such large walls to fit, you know, these huge pieces. But I guess I just like it big. Okay, so thank you so much. We appreciate your participating in the artist talk tonight. And we want to thank all the artists for their participation in the last three um, artist talks. Um, we've really enjoyed learning about each of the artists that have studios at ARC. So thank you everybody for jo joining us. We hope you enjoyed um, the artist talk tonight and we hope to see you at further online events. Take care and have a good evening.